After recently reviewing the original series, Toast of London, I got around to check out the follow-up series, Toast of Tinseltown. How does it compare to the previous show? Are there any major differences and what are they? Hi there, it's Micha. Stay with me for a bit and I will share my findings with you. The new show, or as some sources say, the fourth season of the original show, or fourth series if you prefer the British wording, started pretty much like I predicted in my previous video. Everything is again reset. Forgotten is how Stephen Toast, played by Matt Barry, burned down the Globe Theatre. Erased is the fact that his agent, Jane Pluff, dropped him as a client and that he, due to money problems, had to join his roommate in starring in porn movies. Instead, his agent has some big news. She landed him a starring role in the new Star Wars movie, a franchise even Toast, who often answers who or what, if famous actors or movies are referenced, is familiar with. You're going to Tinseltown Toast. Excited about the chance, the first episode ends with him heading over to Hollywood, or Tinseltown, the town's affectionate nickname, which in the show is the actual name even being spelled out in the famous Hollywood sign on the Hollywood Hills. There the rest of a series, again consisting of six episodes, takes place. On the flight over, he sits next to Russ Nightlife, played by Fred Armisen, whom he befriends and by whom he is invited to stay with while being in California. Russ has a frequent visitor, Billy Tarzania, played by Rashida Jones, who only talks to him in a mix of Spanish, French and English, but the latter played backwards while speaking to Toast when they are alone in proper English, because she doesn't want to get into longer convos with Russ. Toast's agent hands him over to an American agent she is friends with, Brooke Huberman, who works out of her car and is played by Dune McKicken, the same actor who plays his regular agent, Jane Pluff, just with a shitload of makeup in her face. Each episode he is offered a small role to bridge the time he finally gets to star in Star Wars, which provides the basis for his usual adventures and the basis of a running gag as he tells everyone he came to town to star in the new Star Wars movie Guess who's landed a role in the latest Star Wars movie? which everyone answers with a yeah, right, or sure. Of course he also has to do some voice work to keep financially afloat. The receptionist in the LA voice recording studio tells him about an exchange program they have with their sister studio in Soho. So you guessed it. Inside the studio, he is greeted by Danny Bear and Clem Fandango. Hello, Steven. This is Clem Fandango. Welcome to LA. The same guys who got on his nerves in the original show. That is pretty much the setup and all you need to know for a spoiler-free synopsis. I will discuss some further minor spoiler-free details in the review part, but share some quick spoilery details about the storyline in the spoiler zone, after the usual heads up and warning, of course. The big difference between this show and Toast of London is the fact that this one is much more linear. Each week he has a different gig that he usually botches, but he works towards a goal, his Star Wars role, which we see in the last episode. Some guys have all the luck. This is the best moment of my life. This time around there is no reset at the end of each episode as in the London show, which was one of my main distractors there. Here the storytelling is much more like in a regular show, with one long story broken into chapters. There are still some recurring elements, like his daily visit with his agent, replacing his former agent in the old show, while Fred Armisen as Russ takes the place of Ed, Stephen Toast's London flatmate, joining him for breakfast each morning. The voice recording sessions are pretty much the same as always, just that the guys are a little bit more agreeable as usual, more chill and less focused on screwing with Toast, like in the old show. On the other hand, they made Steven a bit dumber than before, with him now even getting words wrong, like believing a chiropractor has something to do with choir practice? His nemesis, Ray Bloody Purchase, only appears in two episodes, leaving him basically without a big scheming jerk in the background. But Toast still manages on his own to spoil all his possible chances for success. To make sure we have a replacement for Mrs. Purchase, with whom he had an ongoing purely sexual relationship in London, Gina Bellman is brought in for one episode as a sex therapist. They also drop the weekly musical number, though one or two numbers make it into the show. 
The whole story, as the previous show, takes place today, but the title sequence for Toast of Tinseltown is a big reference to the 1970s British TV show Shadows, which seems to be the reason why every episode's title card has 1974 listed as the production date. There are also recurring characters who seem to be meant as allusions to Jim Morrison, David Bowie and Charles Manson and his female followers, also leading into the 1970s trope. This also goes with the visual style, presenting the show as if it was filmed that year. This way the show goes a different path than the original series, as that one was meant to look like the kind of cheap TV show a real-life toast might have landed. Something that was fun, but also a detractor in the London series, as this became repetitive soon. They kept the puns and oftentimes intentionally unfunny jokes though. This, like in the previous series, comes down to you liking that kind of humor or not. Again, if that approach would be used once or twice, it would be fine, but it is a big stylistic device in this show. Therefore, only some funny moments were playing out well for me, with others dying on the way. So some people may love the show for it. I personally only partially enjoyed it. My highlights were the scenes with Larry David, popping up in two episodes as a clueless author, making Toast's job a nightmare. By the way, the level of surreal storylines and strange behavior around Toast is the same as before, maybe even cranked up a bit by Armisen's character's weird mannerisms. The weirdest scenes of all, Steven losing an arm and it being reattached, even is one of the rare occasions where they did reset that storyline, like in the old show, at the beginning of the next episode. With that being said, let's get to the rating. The show definitely tried different ways this time around, eliminating some of the main detractors I found in the original series. I liked it therefore a bit better, but it still didn't reach, for me, the point of being a really good show. You might like it though, if you enjoy the kind of humor the series is built around. I unfortunately only like it in parts. On the plus side, there are nice guest appearances, like Cave and Nowak, the actor who plays Nandor in What We Do in the Shadows, who has a short role as an anger management guru, while Natasia Dimitriou, who plays his wife in the vampire satire, appears as Carmen, a singing soap opera actress, again showcasing that Matt Berry loves to cast people he previously worked with. Bill Hader also appears as a dumbass producer, who doesn't know how the mute button on a Zoom call works. Which is also actually funny. Even the sexiest man alive, Paul Rudd, literally pops in for a second. Though Benedict Cumberbatch, who is referenced in the original show a lot, doesn't appear, his Doctor Strange co-star Benedict Wong appears in one episode. And he's also no stranger to Barry, as Wong already appeared in an episode of the IT crowd back in the day. So again, casting a friend. Where the London show scored 5.5 out of 10 points, this one makes it slightly higher to 6 out of 10. Being at least consistently entertaining throughout, supported by the many guest appearances and some good references to the old show. Now if you don't want to get spoiled but enjoyed the video so far, please like it now before you leave. And if you are no subscriber yet, maybe consider to change that. If you don't mind spoilers or have already watched the show, please follow me into the spoiler zone. The only big thing to mention in the spoiler zone, what became of the lead role in Star Wars? Of course his agent got it wrong again. He actually was hired, but doesn't even appear in the movie, as he only voices an alien creature, not even played by himself. And the whole role is just one sentence. There's another Brit starring in the movie though, who is, you guessed it, Ray Bloody Purchase, for no other reason as to bring his nemesis into play again. So Star Wars was another potential shot that leads Toast nowhere. By the way, his roommate turns out to be D.B. Cooper, another 70s illusion while a Rashida Jones character is an undercover FBI agent. The really weird thing is the ending though. In the last episode, Steven is kidnapped several times by the worst and most idiotic goons ever, who keep mistaking him for Ray Purchase, the star of Star Wars. Tired of their mistake, they decide to shoot Toast so they can't mistake him again. With gun to his head, the show ends, as this will likely be the last time we will ever see him, we are left on the note that he presumably dies. Though undoubtedly, if the show continues, it would either be resolved or just ignored and never addressed again. In any case, the show ends as weird as it could, not really raising the overall impression. That's it. Did you see either of the two shows? If so, does my review align with your findings? Let me know in the comments. 
As always, if you enjoyed this video, like it and feel free to share it with your friends. And why not subscribe to my channel so you won't miss any future video. Make sure to also hit the notification bell to get a heads up whenever a new video is posted. So much for now, see you next time and thanks for watching!